without further ado, I would like to present to you the first panelist. Uh, he is Dr. Koja, Özgür Koja. Uh, after spending of qu uh, years of quantitative research and teaching physics, math, and astronomy in different countries, Dr. Koja uh, decided to journey to new perspectives in the fields of philosophy and religion. His studies focus on Islamic philosophy, theology, spirituality, science and religious discussion, environmental ethics, interreligious discourse, and contemporary Islamic movements and ideologies. Please welcome Dr. Koja. Uh, yeah, thank you. So thank you for uh, privileging us with your presence here today. Uh, my share in this discussion is to give you a broad overview of the book. So uh, this is what I'm going to do. Now I'm going to read my notes. I read this book with a sense of joy and awe. Uh, in so that others may live. Erkan Kurt brings together 40 essays written by Fethullah Gülen, one of the most important and influential Muslim thinkers an activist of our time. As you might know, I think I assume that you're all familiar with the Hizmet movement, which he inspired, a transnational, global, faith-inspired movement. And the participants of this movement have managed to establish schools, dormitories, educational institutes, interfaith and intercultural dialogue institutes, foundations, media organizations, humanitarian aid organizations around the globe. We're talking about something global. It's a transnational, global, uh, one of the most influential Muslim movements, uh, as we know. And the inspirer of this movement here, uh, Erkan Kurt wants to penetrate the mind of this inspirer. The stated purpose is not an easy task to achieve, though, for Gulen has a very large corpus with more than 80 books and thousands of audio recordings that haven't yet being published in a book form. Generally, his ideas are spread over this large corpus in a quite unsystematized manner. Oftentimes, one has to collect bits and pieces to explore Gulen's position on a given issue. His tendency to express himself in a symbolic and poetic language adds further difficulty to the systematization of his thought. This style is understandable from the perspective of Gulen's primary purpose, that is to inspire spiritual awakening and social activism. The global hizmet movement that he inspired evinces how efficient his discursive strategy on the participants on, and supporters of the movement. There, however, seems to be an underlying systematic intellectual content behind the unsystematic stylistic structure. Kurt attempts to, I'm Kurt, I mean, I read it as Kurt, but it's Kurt actually in Turkish. Kurt attempts to penetrate this stylistic structure and wants to present the reader with, a, with the unifying themes of Gulen's thought. To achieve the task, he chooses and groups the articles in a way that might allow the reader to conceive, the, uh, conceive that Gulen's writing aim not only to inspire people, but also to construct in a highly systematic and intellectual fashion the principles that can guide the activities of the global hizmet movement in the midst of the complexities of the modern world. The book consists of uh, six chapters. The first chapter offers some of Gulen's most definitive writings on an ideal society and civilization. Now, this is understandable. There's a big chasm, a big gap between the ideals of, the textual ideals, ideals of the Muslim world and its realities. So this drives him. There is something better can be achieved, but the realities is not as such. So, he wants to present you with an ideal, with a dream, so that you can, he can, he can uh, awaken that, that passion within you towards that dream. By the way, he doesn't, uh, lose, he doesn't detach himself from the reality. He always with, finds himself within the context of reality, but he wants to bring that ideal into the reality. So somewhere between, he's not an idealist, He's a realist with a, a dream, I mean, as you can see in the book. The, the second chapter focuses on how the articles of Islamic faith, if understood correctly, transforms a believing individual and eventually society. Now, in the second chapter, as far as I can uh, say, uh, he looks at the fundamental articles of faith in Islamic <coughs> tradition, such as what? Such as 
and the unity of God, right? I mean, the Muslims believe that there's one God, and this robust unity is at the center of Islamic faith, and this one God is transcendent and immanent at once. Transcendent in the sense that God is beyond everything, but immanent in the sense that God is closer to us than our own consciousness. So it brings these two properties together, transcendence and immanence. Now, the, but how this belief is transformative, he wants to talk about that too. Once you believe in such a God, now there is no intermediation between that one God and you. Now you find yourself in the presence of God. And this is a really efficient tool to, uh, to create a, a culture of ethic, an ethical transformation. Now, because now you are in the presence of God. So he, he, he traces the implications of all of the articles of faith in his writings. Uh, and especially in the second chapter. In the third chapter, Gulen shares the essentials of his ambitious moral project that revol revolves around such lofty concepts as love, mercy, and forgiveness. In the fourth chapter, Gulen presents a practical and tangible project to substantiate these abstract ideas, namely education. Now, in the fourth chapter, he focuses on his uh, uh, education. Now, if he just would have talked about these things, uh, like you know, in a theoretical way, uh, he wouldn't be this influential. He's not only a preacher; he speaks. He tells people what to do. He's also an activist at the grassroots level of society. So it's a rare achievement, as far as I can see, uh, bringing the two together, being a really profound, uh, having a really profound theoretical achievement, and. Act, uh, being an activist at the grassroots level of society, really transformative. Uh, that is a rare achievement, as far as I can see, in the intellectual history of Islamic world. So Gulen's educational project aims to raise individuals who can reconcile religion and science, tradition and modernity, reason and... Now, this is his grand project, grand intellectual project, education. Now, he wants to create an educational project in which Religion and science, tradition and modernity, reason and revelation can be reconciled. There is no actually a war between the two. We have an expert on, on religion and science among us here, Dr. Clayton. He can actually, uh, he can, I believe, talk about this issue better than me. But he, wants, he doesn't see a contradiction between the two. Religion and science can be reconciled. Heart and reason can be reconciled. This synthesis, he wants to achieve a tenable uh, and successful synthesis of the both. Tradition and modernity. He's a really traditional man. He grants himself in the traditional sciences of Islam. He's a really pious man. But at, at, at the same time, he wants to embrace modern values and modernity, the achievements of modernity. He's, he's approaching both of them, tradition and modernity, in a selective way, though. He doesn't take it in a whole sum. He, he's, but I think we can say he's a really traditional man with a aim, uh, with, a, with, a, with a willingness to embrace the positive achievements of modernity. And you can see this very uh, tendency in his educational project, in educational writings. And the fifth chapter includes articles that discusses the characteristics of what Gulen called people of service who are pious, devoted to their cause, socially active. I think we can call them religious humanists. Uh, they are religious, they are socially active. Now, in, in, he's, a, he's, a, he's deeply inspired by Sufi tradition, but you don't see the same tendency in him uh, towards isolation from society. He's very much in society. He wants to find God within society. He equates even service to God is service uh, to people, or vice versa, servicing, you know, uh, reaching out to people, giving to people. That horizontal relationship between you and your fellow beings will strengthen your relationship, that vertical relationship between you and God. There's no contradiction here. Uh, you have, one has to have both in his view. This, uh, he's a really pious man. He's deeply inspired by Sufism, and he also wants to see a spiritual death in practicing religion. But this vertical relationship must be 
supported and bolstered by this horizontal relationship between you and other fellow human beings. So you see him as a social activist. This is what I want to say, a pious, religious, humanist, a God-centered world, but also in this world, the other fellow human beings finds a very sacred place. And in the final chapter, he brings together the articles that presents Gulen as a Muslim scholar this time, particularly as a Muslim. Other writings are for, I mean, uh, he's a pretty universal man in other right. But in the last chapter, he appears to be a Muslim scholar, particularly with a particular intensity, uh, dealing with the essentials of Islamic tradition. The very last article, especially in this book, I think you must, uh, you might want to look at that one with a particular uh, uh, attention. In the last article, he exposes his deep attachment and deep love for the prophet of Islam. He's a lover of the prophet. He's not a, he doesn't only see God as, a, as the beloved, but in his worldview, the prophet, not only a messenger conveying message, but also a beloved. Yes. So in this regard, uh, you might want to look at uh, the very last article to see his passionate attachment to the prophet of Islam. And I'll stop here. I think my 10 minutes is over. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll have Dr. Skubik. Daniel Skubik uh, is professor of law, ethics, and humanities at California Baptist University. He teaches public and private international law, constitutional law, and phil philosophy of law. He earned his master's degree in political science and his doctoral degree in philosophy. Please welcome Dr. Skubik. Thank you very much for coming this evening. I will try to be brief. I look very much forward to the conversation that we'll be able to have uh, once all of we panelists have had our say. And I want to start now with Gulen, but with a fellow by the name of James Madison. Uh, some of you may recognize the name. Uh, one of the founding fathers. In the 1780s, one of those who helped frame the Constitution under which we live today. And in defense of that Constitution, as one of the writers of what we call the Federalist Papers, that is when there was a debate about whether to ratify that Constitution or not, Madison made some interesting points about what it meant for we human beings to be human beings. If we were angels and acted only as angels, angelically, we wouldn't need a constitution. We wouldn't need law. We'd only do what was good for ourselves and for our fellows. If we were only demons and acted only demonically, constitution would be useless, would never be followed because we'd always act only selfishly. But a constitution, said Madison, is desirable and possible because we are at least angelic enough to know that we can and should follow legal guidelines in our behavior and that we do sometimes act demonically and need those constraints. And demonic enough at least recognizing that in our fellows, if not in ourselves, uh, that some constraints would be desirable. And so the Constitution should be ratified and put in place because we are capable of following it and we need to follow it. What was so striking in one of Gulen's essays, Forgiveness and Tolerance, is that Glenn notes, the human being is a creature in which many faults and many virtues go in here. No other creature is host to such contradictions. Our actions can make even the angels envious, and we can be so vile that even the devils feel ashamed. Mm -hmm. So Glenn goes on to speak about what I would then call, to analogize to Madison's discussion of the Constitution as the law of the land, 
an internal constitution. A constitution that we can follow because we're angelic enough to recognize that we do sometimes act demonically and we need some internal constraints, not just the external constraint of the law, but the internal constraint of the heart. And also angelic enough that we can recognize those guidelines as being desirable. And to constrain ourselves when we're honest enough to recognize that it's not only our fellows, but we ourselves who can act demonically. And so Galen's constitution of the heart is one that focuses on virtue, but virtue of a particular sort of a sort that I find very compelling. He goes on to note, after claiming these internal contradictions in our very state of being, and so for humanity, forgiveness is everything. Forgiving and being forgiven is a key state of our being in this world. That we will need forgiveness, we will act as we ought not. That we should always be ready to forgive because others will often, towards us and others, act as they ought not. But that forgiveness itself can come only from virtue. That being able to forgive is itself an expression of virtue. Well, how exactly should we understand that virtue? How is it that the forgiveness which is so necessary, guided by that internal constitution of virtue, how are we to understand that to play out, to be erected and then work out in our lives? If it really is a matter of dignity and virtue, Gulen says, and the focus is, as much as we need forgiveness, not to be forgiven, but to forgive. First and foremost, to forgive. And in forgiving, we find forgiveness. Well, it still doesn't quite answer exactly what it is, this virtue that we're supposed to pursue, this virtue which is the internal constitution, which gives scope, gives space, gives power to this forgiving and being forgiven. So in virtue and happiness, he goes on to note that there's, well, a direct tie, not just between virtue and forgiveness, but virtue and happiness, and that Without virtue, happiness is out of reach. And exactly what is this happiness that's out of reach? Is it having a smile on your face all the time? Uh, having sufficient money in your bank account? Not having any problems with your iPhone? <laughs> is it something else? An Aristotelian happiness is of course flourishing. That's what Aristotle really means when he talks about happiness, and that's the usual English translation. In his ethics, it's a matter of flourishing, having a full and flourishing life, that is of utilizing all the aspects that, and of course this is my interpretation on Aristotle, uh, all that which God has given, fully utilized, not for the self, but for the community. As Gulen himself recognizes when he speaks of a concept of civilization, it is so easy to confuse education with enlightenment, and what we need are not educated individuals, but enlightened individuals. As important as education is, it is education with a particular purpose, that is, the willingness and the ability to give to the community. And that, then, is the measure of happiness or flourishing. 
Not what I get from the community, but what I give to the community without seeking anything specific, without any seeking any reward or payment in return. As God has gifted, so those gifts are passed on to the community of which I'm a part, the civilization of which I'm a part. For indeed, for Gulen, that's what creates a civilization, that there are those members of the community, of the civilization, willing to give one to another. Well, we're a little bit closer, but still not quite filling out exactly, well, what is this virtue? For Aristotle, it was developing an ethical point of view, and a particular ethical point of view that he was willing to argue about and for. What sort of virtue is Goulin presented? The man of virtue, or as he puts it in a subsequent essay, the man of the heart, always questions himself. He's so busy with his own failings that he has no time to criticize the faults of others. He does his best to exemplify goodness and to direct the gaze of others toward God. He turns a blind eye to the faults of others, responding to their mistreatment of him with a smile. In this way, he overcomes their misdeeds with kindness. He never intends to offend anyone, no matter how many times he himself is hurt. He does not violate the rights of any person or respond to an attack with anger. He acts calmly, even in the most urgent situations. Regardless of his circumstances, he's always preoccupied with his spiritual task, striving to live according to the heart. What is virtue? It's not attaining a particular state. It's not exhibiting particular habits. is living for the other. It is first what we might call tolerance, putting up with the other, no matter what the other does. But more than tolerance, it is an acceptance, a willing embrace, and giving and forgiving the other without regard to oneself without regard to what one might receive in turn. From that may flow flourishing, happiness. Uh, from that may flow civilization. analysis and the beautiful reminders about uh, virtue. Next we will hear to Dr. Tamara Albertini. She is a professor of philosophy at the University of Manila, specializing in Renaissance and Islamic thought. Within Islamic philosophy, her publications aim at reintroducing the vigor of traditions and the vision of Muslim intellectual contributions from the classical uh, traditions. The seminal article, The Seductiveness of Certainty, Certainty, Fundamentalist Destruction of Islam's Intellectual Legacy, published in Philosophy East and West in 2003, has been quoted in annual reports to Congress since its publication. Please welcome Dr. Libertini. Thank you for the introduction, and good evening. Um, I would like to start with a quotation. This is a quotation that tradition attributes to Islam's fourth khalif, Ali ibn Abi Talib, the famous cousin and uh, son-in-law to the Prophet Muhammad. Listen to these words. Do not know the truth by man, but rather know the truth, and you will know its adherence. It's a very profound statement. So don't follow someone just because the person is much talked about because the person is given authority, because the person is famous, right? Maybe the person deserves to be followed, but, and this is the meaning here of the quotation, 
you have to find out for yourself first, is that really the case? Does this person deserve to be followed? I will return to this quotation in a moment, but right now I would like to pretend that I do not know Gulen. I like to pretend that I've never heard of him, and I would like you to make the same effort. I know most of you know him quite well, you know, you've read many of his writings, but just, just forget about it for a moment. And once in a while I'll be alluding to something in the book, and I would like us to go through this exercise to try to find out on our own what are the merits, or to put it provocatively, are there any merits to this, right? We should never read someone or admire someone without first, first checking. Of course, I'm the scholar, I'm the philosopher. We always look at the text, yeah? So let's try to do that. Um, any authorities, right, speaking of who, of, you know, should we follow anyone, any authorities that um, this book brings up, very few in the end. And there is one name that stood out for me, and that's the name of Abu Hanifa. And interestingly, Abu Hanifa is precisely the kind of person who would say, never mind about the fame, always check for yourself. You see, Abu Hanifa is the earliest founder of an Islamic school of law. You know, he created the school of the Hanafites. Right? And um, as uh, every Turk, I'm sure, knows, the law of the land in the Ottoman Empire was Hanafi law. Right? This is the law that the Ottoman Empire felt was doing the greatest justice to the people. Because you see, what makes you a Hanafi is that you always try to figure out what speaks in favor of somebody rather than what speaks against a person, right? And Abu Hanifa himself would have said, or is, said, is reported to have said to his students, what makes you a good student of mine is not to repeat my verdicts, but to find one that is better than mine. You see, Abu Hanifa stands exactly for the kind of scholar who does not any, want any rigidity. Not, you know, do not worry too much about what the masters of the past have done. Rather, study them and try to be better. And I think there is some of that in this text. We don't know the author, right? The text says, so that others may live, right? I think there is some of that. And what I would like to do, although I know the time is very brief, is follow some of the other echoes, the resonances. Um, the author of this book does not really quote, except for scripture, right? We do have powerful quotations from the Quran. But other than that, there are no quotations. So in the resonances and the echoes, I would like to kind of mention a little bit. It's not about saying, oh, this author must have read this text or the other text. I know that this author has read many, many texts. The author has digested those texts and made them his own. And, and the metaphors uh, you know, remind you of this or that other text. But the, the metaphors, too, have been entirely appropriated by the author. I love it when on page 169, the text says, humanity is God's representative on Earth. So if you have the book, just look it up. Otherwise, go and buy the book. Humanity is God's representative on earth. He doesn't say Muslims. He doesn't say such and such Sufi saint. He doesn't say that Khalif or Sultan or whatever you know, comes to mind. He says humanity, all of humankind, all of us, whether we are Muslims or Christians or Jews or Buddhists or Hindus, I suppose whether we are religious at all or not, right? All of us are God's representative on earth. Page 172, he says, Islam is the recitation and interpretation of the book of the universe. And here I would like to pause a little bit. It's extremely well phrased, very powerful. Islam is the recitation and interpretation of the book of the universe. I found that um, the book ma makes ample use of words like interpret, interpreter, interpretation. It comes again and again and again. And you see, this little word in itself is telling you you are dealing with an author who does not want to just repeat what has been said before, who does not want to say, you know, as some Muslims say nowadays, the gates of knowledge or the gates of ishtihad are closed. It's not about that. It's a clear indication, a clear emphasis. Every generation has to review, review, review. Every generation and every individual, as much as he 
or she can, is able to do it, needs to verify, right? And very, very powerful. This here reminded me of an Andalusian philosopher from the 9th, 10th century. His name was Ibn Masara. Ibn Masara was confronted, like every major scholar in the Islamic tradition, with the question, revelation or reason? His answer was both. And that's exactly the answer we also have here. Ibn Masara spoke of two books. And we could, th we could say one book is the one with a capitalized B, the book. What is the book in Islam? Of course, the Quran, the book of Revelation. But Ibn Masara says, very important, right? But there is another book, the book that this book mentions as well, and that is the universe, the cosmos. And we have to do both. Let's say we're very pious, very religious. We're so anxious to do everything right, not miss a single prayer, not a single fast, right? So we're constantly obsessed, maybe in a good way, with the big book, the book of Revelation. But someone like Ibn Masara says, you have to also look and read in the book of the universe. And it always goes together. And here is where there may be indeed a distinctive um, feature to Islam when it comes to reading in the book of the universe, which is another way to say to, to do sciences, right? And which is that in the Muslim tradition, mostly, the point is to become a scientist and find the way to religion. And so, you know, the option does not appear one or the other, right? And Ibn Masara says, and by the way, we have signs in both books, and the Arabic word is ayah. And whether you speak Arabic or not, it suffices that you are Muslim or know something about the Islamic tradition. You know every verse of the Quran is called an ayah, a sign. And Ibn Masara says, we have signs in the Quran, and we have signs in the book of the universe. And we need to read both. And for Ibn Masara, and this is where I'm not sure whether this author would go as far, but for Ibn Masara, the Andalusian philosopher from the 10th century, the position was very clear. In doubt, follow reason. And, I'm, and I can tell, somebody is telling me that I need to you know, make it a little bit faster. So going back to uh, don't follow the man, but follow the truth, and you will find its adherence. How does one do that? It's easily said. And I would like to bring in, very briefly again, another major figure from the classical tradition of Islamic philosophy, and that is Al-Ghazali. Al-Ghazali um, has this incredible autobiography in translation, The Deliverance from Error. And he tells the story of how he found the foundations of knowledge. And that is a powerful connection to this book here, because it speaks of ilm, right? The translation is knowledge. Now, ilm nowadays, in some Islamic uh, schools, is extremely reduced. It has come down to the knowledge needed to fulfill one's ritual obligations. How many ablutions? How many times do you wash? How many times do you do the raqqa? You know, that's called ilm. It is knowledge. But you see, in classical Islam, knowledge is everything. If you look at someone like Al-Farabi, 9th, 10th century philosopher, it's everything. It's philosophy and it's sciences and jurisprudence. All there is, that is really knowledge. Now, this philosopher, Al-Ghazali, was you know, in intrigued. So how do I know? He was the most knowledgeable person of his time, but he had a crisis. And he understood that he knew nothing. Now, what he meant to say, he knew what the Quran says. He knew what Aristotle said. He knew what the astronomers said. But knowledge for him is what he himself could confirm and verify. And here he brought in a ma major term of, of um, Islamic theology, which is fitra, the natural predisposition. Every man is born with a fitra, right? That's classic in classically Islamic. And, um, and I will rush through this too. And the way how Al-Ghazali wanted to do that is by saying, think of a well, a well that's obstructed by debris and refuse. What will you do so that the waters come back to the wells? You will clear the well. You'll take everything out. And the same we should do with our whole beings, not just the mind, but also the heart, everything that's us. Take it out. Take it out. Take it out. You may end putting everything back in, but the difference is that once you put it back in, you're sure of that knowledge. And that's precisely the mark that is to be found 
in this incredible book. Oh, the name is Fatoula Adulain, right? <laughs> and it is a clear invitation expressed in more modern terms, but also attaching itself to a long, long tradition of excellent Islamic scholarship. You have to clear the well, and that makes you an adherent to the truth. Thank you. Uh, and also, if I may, I may add a little comment, uh, sometimes we think that studying the book of universe uh, requires of one being a scientist. I think uh, the, the general reader is invited to do that. Um, and today, after reading my uh, third grader's science report, I learned that spiders have eight legs and six knees in each one of them. <laughs> and they can walk without stumbling. I don't know how they do that. Uh, next, we will hear from Dr. Philip Clayton. Uh, Dr. Philip Clayton is the Ingraham Professor at Claremont School of Theology in Claremont, California. Clayton has taught or held research professorships at Williams College, California State University, Harvard University, Cambridge University, and the University of Munich. His research focuses on biological emergence, religion and science, process studies, and contemporary issues in ecology, religion, and ethics. Please. Fethullah Gulen quotes Basiri, woman and man, youth and old age, the bow and the arrow, each needs the other. Indeed, all parts of the world are in need of each other. Amen. Fethullah Gulen, mediation after mediation after mediation. He finds oppositions, he finds stalemates, he finds the inability to move forward, and he finds a way, a path of mediation through. First, we encounter the claim, there is only secular modernity. That's all that's left. Science has won, values are gone. Ah, but there's another option, he says. Stop, listen to your heart, be open to it. Ah, the secular world is at war with the religious world. You must choose between the two. Ah, there is another option. Open your heart to it. We can move beyond the battles. So then we move into the sphere. Oh. <laughs> That's, That's when people fell asleep. <laughs> I know, I need more space. I'm a big speaker, you know, so I need to, like, move my arms. You can't put me in the corner. There we go. I need more space. Okay, here, I'll stand this way. All right. So, he, then we find, is it still recording, or did I kill the recording? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Your religion is against my religion. Ah, but there is another option. Open your heart to it. Or, equally dangerous, especially in California, all religions are the same. There's no battle because we're all saying exactly the same thing. Or, in California, religion is whatever you make it. <laughs> you know, if you want it to be this, it's this. If you want it to mean this, it means this. No, 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 no. Live into the depth of your own religion. If God has sent you the prophet, listen to the prophet. If, God, if you are a follower of Jew, a follower of Prophet Abraham, live into that way. Be more deeply Jewish. If you are a follower of Prophet Yezu, live into that way. Be more deeply Christian. Because what matters in the end? That you hear the voice of God. And that you live or do the voice of God. That is the path, the only path, through which we find peace. And then finally, last opposition. This is the fifth one, actually. Ah, so you're living into your tradition, but what you find a battle between the religious scholars and the religious mystics. The theoretical people and the practical people. Right? Or you find a battle between the heart and reason. 
Ah, but there is another way. There is a mediation. Open yourself to it. No need to hate reason. But in the end, I think this is too it, Peter Leglen. In the end, he is overcome. His, even his reason is overcome by the greatness of God, by the compassion of God, which draws our love in response. In the end, like Rumi, he finds himself located so completely within God that all thoughts are in some sense God's thoughts, and all actions are in some sense God's action. At the end of the day, Fatul Kulan is a mystic. A mystic so overcome with God like Rumi that there is no other option but to state in poetic words and in the silence of prayer of bowing before God what you see. So I'm going to close just with seven short passages from this text and read them not with the mind. You've had brilliant professors reading, but to read them with the heart, to read them as a mystic. Let's begin with the description of society today, page 43. In our recent history, writes Fethullah Gulen, humanity has drifted from suffering to suffering. We have walked through pits of death, and our search for deliverance has only led us to new calamities. Around the world, established governments have cowed to the greed and ambition of individuals. Today, it is the untouchable elites big companies, and powerful mafias that control our society. What does he say? Drifting from suffering to suffering. What do you hear in this passage? Gulan's heart is pained by what he sees in the world. And he asks, open your heart until you also are pained by what you see in the world. And why? because the heart of God is pained by what he sees in the world. Can you imagine one who is infinitely merciful and compassion, compassionate? Can you imagine the divine pain at the suffering that fills this planet? It's that alone that drives Gulen and us to his myth, to service. Two, in light of that, what is our global calling? Page 143. Our salvation in the sight of God is contingent upon this. This is the true meaning of Islam. In order to secure our future in this world and in the hereafter, we must become a refuge for other souls a refuge for other souls, strengthening their resolve and enlightening their hearts. We must be the ones who confront the challenges of our time, turning our backs on personal interest. What is a refuge? The German word is Zufluxort, a place you go to to flee, to run away and to find a place of safety, a place of healing, a place of silence a place where you can find yourself and your God again. Imagine asking us to be, each one of us to be, that place of refuge for others in their pain. Somehow we must be so filled with this compassion of God that in this suffering world, they can come to us to find that. And that means, my friends, that only with a fullness of soul, only with a fullness of soul can you be a refuge to others. Third, nor is the refuge limited to persons. The land's heart is torn also by what humans do to the planet. He says on page 40, what a pity that this magnificent book of nature, the charming display of beauty, presented by the all-merciful one for our contemplation, is treated like a heap of junk, he says. 
He feels, therefore, even the pain of the animals, the pain of the poor who suffer most from the ruining of the world. Not the rich guys. They won't suffer when the water runs out and when the air is dirty and the ground won't grow. They will buy armies and they will buy food and they'll protect themselves. But when the water runs out in India, it's the poor who will suffer. And Gulan will not draw a line between the human souls and all the suffering on this planet. The refuge that we are, the concern that we are, reaches to them as well. Number four, he offers us a deeper view of being religious. You've heard of something of that, so I'll say less. Listen to this beautiful quote, 133. We are desperately seeking people of the heart. People of the heart. For they are also the people of truth, committed to transcendence. They inquire after the riddles of life, directing their questions to every part of existence and even expecting answers from the infinite. They pursue, pursue truth as if it were the water of life. I want you never to forget that transition from people of the heart to the pursuit of truth. We dichotomize pursuit of truth. That's the professors and the thinkers. People of the heart, that's the religious people, but not for Gulen. In fact, the religious person is so driven to understand what's true that he or she would ask the infinite and see truth as the water of life. Picture a, a lake or a river that brings the water without which you and your family couldn't survive. That's what the truth is. Being religious is equally both. Number five, a hard word, metaphysics. Metaphysics. On page 45, he defines what he means. Metaphysical thought denotes our effort to comprehend existence as the unity of its observable and unobservable aspects. With, listen, without this holistic embrace of both the intellect and the soul, everything crumbles into lifeless fragments. Have you ever heard somebody describe metaphysics? in that way. The unity of all, the embrace of intellect and soul, without which all crumbles into lifeless fragments. This may be the hardest sentence in the book. Metaphysics is difficult. It's subtle. It requires study. It's easy for us to hear a passage from the Holy Quran and to be moved, but to pause and to reflect, what is the prophet saying? What does this tell us about the being of God, who we, in the end, we fully, can't fully know? He calls us to think about what it means for us, not just to be humanists, religious humanists, but to be theists, those who proclaim the name of God, the unity of all in God. Perhaps the hardest calling of all. Hismet, uh, we have tears in our eyes when I call you to serve, when Feta Golan calls you to service, but when he calls you to metaphysics, a different kind of tear <laughs> comes. Number six, unity again. Page 44. To believe is to know the truth as it is. And to love is to apply this meaning to life. To believe is to know the truth as it is, and to love is to apply this knowledge to life. Belief is the most important source of action. It leads the spirit to engage with the whole of existence. And likewise, love is the most important aspect of human thought. I could spend an hour talking just about those two sentences. He has so mixed love and thought, knowledge and action, belief and hismet, together, you will never be able to separate them. And that's why 
You need the full depth and richness of being a Muslim or a Jew or a Christian, of understanding and following the prophet, God's prophet, in order to live this way. Because the belief and the action are tied together like bone and sinew and can never be separated. And for closing, I read the last sentence with no comment. Fetullah Gulen describes our way toward God, our way to God. And I'll just let his words close my comments and sit down. Brothers and sisters, let us proclaim love and dialogue, love and dialogue, in the days when hatred and animosity have darkened the face of the earth. Come, let us enlarge our conscience according to the divine mercy that encompasses all. Let us open the gates of our hearts to all, to all. No long, let us no longer consider ourselves to be a drop dr destined to dry out and vanish. Instead, let us all unite as one cascading river flowing toward the ocean of eternity. We all, we all are human. Our genes contain the trace of Adam, and our essence shares the truth of Ahmed. Then let us stand against all evil and cry out to the universe that we are God's vice regents on earth, and we are the candidates of eternity. Let us walk together in our way toward God hand in hand, and heart in heart. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Clayton, for your beautiful reading, which did not just move the microphone, but I believe it moved our hearts and souls tonight. Thank you very much again. Yeah.